All right, good evening everybody. Pastor Bill Emmons here from Covenant Faith Center in Chatsworth, California. I have to get my other little monitor here. I've got two cameras running, and so I have to get this one over on uh, my Facebook page. So if you'll give me a moment, if you watch regularly, this is uh, routine. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, where is, there I am. Okay. Just take me a minute or less. Man, that one, <laughs> that started me. Okay, that tells me that we're on. And let me double check. Yes, we are. Praise the Lord. Now, I, I didn't know the volume was on in that. I thought I turned all the volumes off. All right, praise the Lord. Once again, Pastor Bill Emmons here from Covenant Faith Center, Chatsworth, California. Welcome you to our program tonight, uh, Bible study, actually, and uh, we've got some, I've got some good things to share with you, and I'm looking forward to sharing them, and I hope you're looking forward to hearing them. So uh, I'm just looking to see who's signing on at this time. Um, I want to go ahead and pray, and i got a couple things to share with you before we get into tonight's teaching. But Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that we can call you our Father. Thank you that we can call you our God. Thank you that we can call you our covenant partner. We praise you because you are a covenant-keeping God. You are faithful to your word and to your compassionate nature. Father, we know that we can call upon you, that you will hear our prayers, you will answer our prayers, you will deliver us, your word says. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share the word tonight. Holy Spirit, rise up within me and give me utterance. Cause me to speak as an oracle of God, and I declare that no person will be able to resist the intelligence and the wisdom and the inspiration with which I will speak tonight. Holy Spirit, I ask you to open the hearts and minds of the hearers, those that listen tonight and those that will listen after the fact. That the anointing would be so strong that it would, it, wherever they are around the world, when they hear this message, it will destroy the yoke in their lives and set them free. Father, I thank you for signs and wonders and miracles, and I declare, it, I declare the glory of the Lord over this time tonight, this Bible study. Manifest your presence, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, we are live on Facebook, on uh, the, the church uh, page at Covenant Faith Center in Chatsworth, California, and we're also live on my Facebook page, which is William E. Emmons. And uh, we're live on Periscope, and we're live on Twitter. And we are using our faith, believing God, for the opportunity to expand out to more social media platforms. And uh, you can believe with us for that. Our partners, I know, are believing and supporting, so giving us the ability to reach out and do more. We appreciate our partners. Thank you so much. Um, I want to encourage you tonight. Uh, right now, the Southwest Believers Convention is happening in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, <clears throat> you can get that online. Uh, you can go to Eagle Mountain Church, or you can, hey, Torsha, good to have you with us tonight. Hallelujah. Uh, or you can go to um, kcm.org and look for, uh, uh, what would, um, Mary, what's a current thing? What do they call it? Victory Channel? The Victory no, no, Channel? the current, when you go scroll across. Oh, Southwest Believers Convention? No, no, you're scrolling across and you want to find live. Und oh, live. Live, just live? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, she usually gets it and I watch it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so you would scroll across to live and then if you're looking for the services for yesterday and today, uh, you would, I think, go on demand, wouldn't they, Mary? Yeah, if they're up already. I don't yeah, know. if they're up already. So you just have to look. But it's all there. Then you go to the Victory Network, and the Victory Network uh, will also have them live as well as available for viewing after the fact. So I want to encourage you to do that as well. Worth it. We're, as far as we're concerned, we're in convention right now, and uh, we're he hearing the word and being ministered to, being fed, and being blessed. Praise God. All right. Let's, um, let me go through Psalm 91. You ought to be doing this every day. And I'm doing it just to set the example because I do it. 
Psalm 91, Amplified Translation, uh, it's a declaration of faith taken from Psalm 91. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. On Him I lean and rely, and in Him I confidently trust. Therefore, He will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me with His pinions, and under His wings shall I trust and find refuge. His truth and His faithfulness are a shield and a buckler to me. I shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor the arrow, the evil plots, and slanders of the wicked that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. Only a spectator shall I be, myself inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High, as I witness the reward of the wicked. Because I have made the Lord my refuge and the Most High my dwelling place, there shall no evil befall me, nor any plague or calamity come near my dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over me to accompany and defend and preserve me in all my ways of obedience and service. They shall bear me up in their hands, lest I dash my foot against the stone. I shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion, and the serpent shall I trample underfoot, because I have set my love upon him. Therefore he will deliver me. He will set me on high, because I know and understand his name and have a personal knowledge of his mercy, love, and kindness, and trust and rely on him, knowing he will never forsake me. No, never. And he won't forsake you either. Hallelujah. I shall call upon him. He will answer me. He will be with me in trouble. He will deliver me. He will honor me with long life. Will he satisfy me and show me his salvation? That's one of the best things you can do right there every day. Start your day off with that. Uh, you can even end your day with it. Do both. Do it in the morning. Do it at night. Anytime during the day when the devil tries to put pressure on you and get you anxious or concerned or uh, fearful, you pull that out and you begin to declare that over yourself. And I'm telling you, it'll, it'll change your mind. It'll change the way you think. It'll change your emotions. It'll calm you down. And uh, it'll bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. We just lost connectivity between the iPad and the, uh, that's interesting, and between the Mevo camera. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to have to figure out what's it. This worked perfect for the first two weeks. I'm declaring it's still going to work perfect in the name of Jesus. All right, we're still live on on uh, Periscope and on Twitter, even though I have no control over it now. Uh, I can monitor at least the uh, pa uh, Facebook pages. All right, don't forget our foundational scripture for uh, our ministry. Uh, Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law, which is the word of God, shall not depart out of your mouth night and day. You shall meditate upon it. And he says, then you shall, well, he says that you may observe and do all that's written therein. Then you shall make your way prosperous. Then you shall deal wisely and have good success. And that's, to me, that's the equation for godly success right there. That we are making our way prosperous. We're dealing wisely we're, and we're having good success. Praise the Lord. All right. Get into our Bible study tonight. I have no other announcements at this point to share with you. Uh, what John said about faith, part three. You know, I never go into these uh, teachings with the idea of doing a series. And in reality, this is part three on this particular subject, what John said about faith. And John didn't say a whole lot in the sense of talking about the force of faith or the power of faith. He talked more about the belief and trust of faith. Uh, but they do go hand in hand. And in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he talks about faith principles. So we're, we're not even into 2nd John, 3rd John. We're still in 1st John here. But he, he specifically mentions some things that are very powerful. And in order to really get all that he's saying, you have to tie it together with other scriptures. So we go to 
things Paul said uh, and, and other places and uh, tie it all together so you get a well-rounded picture. All right, uh, brief recap. Abraham's faith moved him to action, Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19. Uh, called by God to go offer his son, Genesis 22, 3. At the foot of the mountain where he was to offer his son as a sacrifice, he declared, I and the boy will go and worship and shall return. He was saying, not only are we going to go, we, myself and my son, are going to return. He's talking to his servants. That's Genesis 22, verses 4 and 5. Up on the mountain when they got up there, uh, they built an altar, placed the wood on it, and Isaac asked, uh, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? That's Genesis 22, verses 6 through 9. And Abraham answered, God will provide himself a sacrifice, verse 8. And God did provide both the, the immediate sacrifice where the ram was caught in the bush, as verse 13. But that's a prophetic statement because God says he will provide himself a sacrifice. Through Jesus, God was putting himself on that altar, ratifying a covenant with us through Jesus. So praise God for that. God cannot, we read last week that... that um, God cannot lie, and he swore by himself since there was no other uh, higher power to swear by, and he made an oath or a covenant. So two things that cannot be broken, and, and we know that God keeps his word, and he can be trusted, he can be relied upon to be faithful to his word and to his compassionate nature. Praise God for that. Amen? All right. So... God blessed Abraham because of, of his obedience. That's uh, verses 17 and 18. Abraham had three components to his faith. Uh, we gave a little, you know, thing for it, BSA. Uh, he believed God. He said his faith, and he acted on his faith. And you can find uh, that action in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 19. All right, so now let's get back to the third part of that. There were three elements of that faith or that miracle of faith, and that was he believed God, he declared his faith, and he, you saw that when he talked to his servants at the base of the mountain before they went up, I and the boy will go and worship and shall return. And then we know in Hebrews it talks about how he was so confident in God keeping his promise to, from Isaac, make his descendants as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, and that tribes and nations would come from his offspring through Isaac, and that all the nations of the world would be blessed through the descendants of Isaac. Well, that could not happen because Isaac was only 14 years old. He wasn't married, had no children. So if, if Abraham sat, literally physically sacrificed him, then God would have turned out to be a liar. He made promises they didn't keep. <clears throat> well, God's not going to let that happen. So God provided a sacrifice at that moment, which was the ram caught in the bushes. Amen. So the third part of that three-part uh, faith action was that he acted on the word. He acted on what God had said. He didn't just say, I believe. We got a lot of Christians today, when you ask them about healing, well, I believe in healing. Well, are you healed? Well, no, you know, not everybody gets healed. I heard a preacher last night uh, just actually say that. He said, you know, these faith people, that's us, hallelujah. <laughs> he said, uh, those faith people, you know, uh, they say, they go around saying that healing is for everybody, and the Bible is very clear on that subject that healing is not for everybody. Well, back up. I'm going to have to kick over their golden calf because the Bible says salvation has come upon all men. Jesus died for the whole world, and in salvation is healing. Go back and look at it in the Greek and the Hebrew dictionary and you'll find out that it includes healing, it includes prosperity, it includes peace, wellness, all those things that the curse tries to take from us, the devil wants to steal from us. Jesus redeemed us, redeemed. That means to put us back in a condition which we have to actually go back to the original uh, plan of God, which the pattern we can see in Genesis before 
Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve fell or sinned, the plan and the pattern was that there was no sickness, there was no disease, there was no poverty, no lack, no fear, uh, no anxiety, depression, oppression, no COVID-19, all right, all that stuff. In fact, Deuteronomy 28 verse 61 says, including every sickness and every disease, not even written in the book. Well, COVID-19 specifically is not named in Deuteronomy 28, but it does talk about fevers and plagues and, and things of the nature of, of a pandemic. So it is covered. And Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath, past tense, redeemed, redeemed us from the curse. That means putting us back in the condition before the fall. So how come so many Christians are sick? And how come so many die of disease? Well, God said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. If you don't know what the word says, you can't have faith for it. If you know what the word says, and you don't meditate upon it, and put it into action in your life with, with corresponding actions to that word, or to your faith, then you're not going to get results. And so uh, when it talks, the Bible says in Hebrews, when the Hebrew... Uh, spies went over into the promised land they came back, ten gave an evil report it says, and two gave a report that is what God said and he, it says there in Hebrews that they could not enter into the promised land because they did not mix faith with the promises or with the word that God gave them they didn't do what Joshua and Caleb did, which was talk about what they saw in the land and we can take it. Let's go up at once and take it. Why? Because God said they could take it. It was theirs. Amen. So we have to mix our faith with the words. Not just enough to know the word. It's not enough to memorize scripture. It's not enough to go around spouting, uh, you know, and you know, and and, and uh, saying scripture, you know, out of memory. You've got to meditate upon it until the revelation hits you down in here. When that revelation hits you, it's no more something from your head. Is something that comes out of your spirit now. <clears throat> All right, so Abraham believed God. He was declaring his faith, and he acted on God's promise. So in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, from the King James translation, as it is written, I have made thee, Abraham, a father of many nations. Before him who, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, that means make alive the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now Abraham was believing and declaring. In fact, when God changed his name, when he made covenant with him, he changed it from Abram, Abram, <laughs> to Abraham, and added a Hebrew letter in there that we put for an H, we put it as an H in there, but it was a letter that represented deity, that God was adding to Abraham himself as his God, his covenant partner. And he changed him. And so Abraham didn't continue going around introducing himself as Abram. Every time he'd meet somebody and they'd ask, you know, what's your name, where are you from, who's your family, what city, you know, which is common back in those days to find out, you know, where somebody's coming from. He would say, my name is Abraham. And he was identifying and speaking of something that had not yet manifested, which was that his children would be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, and nations would come from them, and kings would come from them, and so forth. That hadn't happened yet, but he didn't wait until it happened to begin to declare it. The moment God made covenant and promised by himself and swore the covenant to Abraham, Abraham, from that point forward, would declare what God had said. All right? So here it says uh, that God's, God said, As is written, I have made thee Abraham, a uh, father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not, or which have not yet manifested, as though they have, as though they were already manifested. We have to begin to declare the end result from the beginning, like God does. He speaks the end from the beginning. And we have to do the same thing, that we will 
pray and say amen and declare the end, which is what we're praying for, what we're using our faith for, declare the, the finished work before we ever see it manifested. I, I used to have people tell me, well, you know, that's, that's just really kind of lying, isn't it? You're talking about something that doesn't exist, that isn't manifested. And, and I, I said, no, I'm not. I'm doing like God. The Bible says that we're to copy God. We're to follow his example. And if we're going to copy God, we're going to be doing what he does and saying, speaking the way he speaks. And so we begin declaring the end result of our faith project from the beginning of the project, whether it's healing or finances or you know whatever it may be, a business, um, your ministry, <clears throat> you declare where you're headed and not where you've been. You declare where you're headed instead of what is manifested right now. We walk by faith, not by sight. So if you're walking by faith, you're looking ahead to the goal or the vision, and that's what you're declaring. When symptoms try to hit you of sickness and disease, instead of going around talking what is, what is manifested? Well, that would be the symptoms of the sickness or the disease. We need to begin to declare what Jesus provided, which is redemption from that curse and healing by his stripes. And we begin to declare, I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. Not I'm going to be, but I am, because the work has already been done. It already belongs to you. Amen? Now, verse 18 of Romans 4 says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. <laughs> it says, now dead in the, or the King James, when he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was about 90, and normally women do not give birth to children at 90 years old. And um, at 100 years old, normally men do not produce offspring. So it says he didn't weaken, weaken in faith. He didn't because he considered not. His, he didn't take into consideration what the natural was saying. You're too old. Your body can't produce. Sarah's womb can't produce. That's all the natural. That, that is what is manifested. But he began to declare what God promised. Amen. And he didn't weaken in faith. When you consider the circumstance, when you consider what is right now, which may not agree with God's word, when you take that in consideration, you weaken your faith. Right now with this COVID-19 uh, scam, and I'm going to be blunt with you, it's a scam. Uh, and I'm not saying th that it doesn't exist, but it's nothing like what they've been telling us. I won't get into all that, but you can do some research, you'll find out. Um, anyway, the, um, the, the news, if you watch the news, I, we, don't, we will not watch secular news with this COVID-19. We didn't hardly watch it at all before. I've watched for local news, things that are going on around the, our area, but Beyond that, I'm not going to sit and listen to all the negativity they put out because they are geared to fill you with fear. And so 90% of the news reported is bad news. And when it comes to this, uh, again, so-called pandemic, as it's uh, just like the flu, you know, goes around the world, and it's not even as bad as the flu. Uh, but they're making a big issue out of it, all right? And every time they talk, what do they tell you? They tell you so many more people have been infected, so many p more people have died. Well, if you take that as fact, and that's all you consider, you're considering the current circumstance, the way they're portraying it. That will weaken your faith. You cannot afford to spend your time an hour a day watching, or maybe if you're home locked in, you know, like they're trying to get us to be, uh, watching the news all day long, you know, that all that's going to do is feed you unbelief, and it'll it'll weaken your faith. So we can't afford to do that. I I have been doing a um, bit of research on uh, geology and tectonic plate movement and so forth, and of course 
that involves volcanic activity and earthquakes. So I've been uh, watching one particular person who uh, gives a daily update on activity around the world, and, and I've learned a lot uh, about volcanism and, and earthquake activity and the movement of plates and so forth. But I, if I spend too much time on that rather than on the word, it will begin to take control of my thinking and I begin to think about earthquakes and how they happen and how big they can be and what they can do instead of believing God that says take dominion and have authority over all his handiworks and our ground, our earth, are the handiworks of God and bind and loose, which the Bible says whatever we bind is bound, whatever we loose is loose. If I spend too much time listening to this guy talk about earthquakes and vo volcanoes erupting and you know things like that, it will begin to replace the faith that I have that I can bind that up, that I can take dominion and authority in the name of Jesus, and every knee must bow to that name. So you have to you have to make sure that you don't feed on the unbelief of the world. He didn't consider his body. Don't consider the news. Don't consider the, the uh, riots and the protests and all that stuff that they're actually lying about. They're not even telling you the truth about what it is. Uh, it, it's all about disrupting this country before this election. I don't want to get into it, but that's what it's about. Uh, the, the left, the socialists, are trying to take control. And, uh, you know, we, we can't get caught up in that. Amen? So we need to believe that God is able, and, and that not only is he able, he will do on our behalf. And the Bible says if we humble ourselves and pray and seek God's faith and turn from fleshly ways, that God will hear from heaven and he will forgive us of our sins and he will heal our land. That includes our nation, our state, and our city. So if you spend time considering what the news says, it's going to weaken your faith if you don't override that with more time considering what God has promised. He said, no evil shall befall you. We just read it, Psalm 91. No plague will come near your dwelling. No weapon formed against you will prosper. What do you spend your, your time considering? The word, God's covenant promises, or what the world is saying? And I, I found myself just, just the last couple of days, I had been listening to that. I have been doing some research on the, uh, a lot of people are calling it the pandemic because it's a plan that was set in motion back in 2010. I was doing some research on that. And I saw just how evil it was and, and the plan, everything they they had planned is what is being implemented right now. And if that gets a hold of you, you'll begin to live in fear. You'll begin to think, well, I better buy me a, a, a trailer or something, go off and live in the woods and get away from this control, this military, military socialistic control they want to put on this nation, in fact, on the whole world. You can't be considering that more than you consider God's promise that no evil shall befall you, that no weapon formed against you will prosper, that when you pray, God will answer. So you got to consider God and his word more than the circumstance that is in front of your face, which 90% of the time what you're hearing is nothing but lies, the lies of the devil, trying to instill fear in your life. And I, I will not be afraid. Amen? Amen. All right. So... Uh, not being weak in faith, verse 19, he considered not his own body, now dead, uh, and uh, because he was about 100 years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. What was he giving glory to God for? Was he giving glory to God for the fact that his body couldn't produce children and his wife couldn't have a baby? Was he giving glory to God because they were too old and it was too late? No, they were giving glory to God for the promises that God, the covenant promises that God made to them. We've got to quit glorifying the works of the devil and start glorifying the works of God. Pastor Mary ministered Sunday and she talk, talked about remember, remember what God has done. Because when you think and remember what God has done, you begin to rejoice for what he's done. And when you begin to rejoice, you're releasing faith, and faith will cause you to recover what the devil's been stealing from you. That's what she ministered. If you didn't hear it, go back and listen to last Sunday's message, and I'll tell you, it'll bless you. All right. So, 
in verse 21 it says, and being fully persuaded that he, God, uh, that what he, God, had promised or covenanted, he, God, was able also to perform. Therefore it was imputed to him for rights. It was counted on the ledger. It was counted as right standing with God because he walked in faith and trust in God instead of faith in the flesh or in his inability or what the world is saying. You got that? All right. Genesis 22, verse 5, King James Translation. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, <clears throat> laid upon the, his son, took the fire in his hand and a knife, and went both of them together. Isaac spake unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here, here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but uh, <clears throat> where's the burnt offering? Where's the lamb for the offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for their burnt offering. So they went on uh, both together. He acted on what God had promised. The potential of sacrificing his son on that altar did not deter him from trusting God for the promises, even if he had to end up killing his son. Now, by the way, that is not something God would ever tell anybody to do today. That was a one-time deal because Abraham was to be the father of faith, the father of them that believed, the father of both the Jews and the Christian uh, church. We are supposed to be people of faith, not just a belief in God, not just a belief in heaven, but people of faith who walk by faith like Abraham did. All right, Genesis 22, 9, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood on the altar in order and, and, in order, and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest or reverence God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. He was entering into a covenant that would manifest down the road in the sacrifice of Jesus because any time a covenant partner calls on you to do anything and you're in covenant, you're obligated to, to receive and act upon and, and do what that covenant partner needs, whether it's giving him money, uh, taking him in, protecting him, defending his life whatever it might take. God needed a man that would be in covenant to give him authority to send Jesus into the world to replace the lambs that were being killed every year and become the final sacrifice as like John the Baptist and Paul the Apostle both talked about Jesus in terms of the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. And so they recognized that. Well, the Jews immediately you know, they're, they're looking at John the Baptist, and when that came out, they looked at Jesus. He's the Passover lamb. He's the lamb of God. What is that? The sacrificial lamb that would die in place of the person. And that would be the fulfillment of the covenant promise God made going clear back to Adam and Eve in the garden when they fell, but more clearly going back to Abraham. Abraham was willing to give his only begotten son, yet he promised multitudes as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky offspring through Isaac but he believed in, in, in Hebrews it says that he believed that if need be God would raise Isaac up out of the ashes that means that Abraham was in his mind uh, Isaac was already sacrificed he committed he gave it to God but that again like I said that gave God the ability to move into the earth at the time that was right to send his son, his only begotten son, who paid the price for our sins. Hallelujah. All right. Now, uh, let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. I know this is, we're talking about what John said about faith, and we talked all, kind of all the way around. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, King James translation. And he, Jesus, is the propitiation. The word propitiation means substitute sacrifice 
He was our sacrifice. It says for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. All right. So, hereby, verse 3, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. How do I know I know God? If I keep his word. If I don't keep his word, then do I really know him personally? Or do I know about him? So we've got to get past the knowing about God to the knowing God. When you get born again, you begin a pathway that will lead you to the, hopefully if you continue on that pathway, will lead you to knowing God. When you're first born again, you don't really know God. You have right standing with Him. You've been cleansed from all your sin and unrighteousness. But you don't really know God yet. That takes time. You're going to have to get in the Word. Get to know God through His Word. Get to know God through your times of prayer and fellowship with Him. Get into a church that preaches and teaches the Word. And, and let your pastor uh, teach you about the character of God. The wisdom of God. The ability of God. So you get to know about God. But take it beyond that to where we finally get to know God himself. I know God for who he is in my life, not just who he is for you know, the world or what, he, what it says in the Bible. I know that, but I know him personally. I talk to him daily. And I've had people kind of, uh, you know, ask me with, you know, how they raise their eyebrows, like, really, you know, um, you talk to God? Uh, and my answer is always absolutely, yes, daily. And I suppose God talks to you, right? Yes, he does. Every day. How do I know that? Well, first the Bible says it. He says, call on me and I will answer. Now there's a whole lot of scripture I can give you, but we won't take time right now. God hears my prayers. God answers my prayer. When I talk to him, he talks back to me. When I ask a question, he gives me an answer. I, I, I really feel sad for Christians who don't talk to God in faith and do not ever hear from God. My, my question to them is, how much time do you spend fellowshipping with God in worship, in prayer, and meditating His Word? Because those three things are what are going to help you to develop a personal relationship with God. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't have that. So they know a lot about God. But too many of them don't really know God. They don't know his personality. They don't know his character. They don't know his wisdom. They don't know his ability. They don't know what he will do and what he won't do. Well, praise God, we're growing, aren't we? Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So, it says um, in verse 3, I read it, Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now that, that's the, talking about people who are religious. They can quote scripture. They might go to church even. They might carry a 50-pound Bible around to just show how spiritual they are. <laughs> but if, if they don't keep his word, then they don't really know God. Because when you know God, you keep his word. And that's one of the evidences that we're getting to know God, is we start becoming a doer of the word, like James says. James says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. In fact, we're going to read that next. Let me finish these verses, then we'll read that. Um, Whoso keepeth his word, that's whoever keeps God's word, in him verily or truly is the love of God perfected. When you begin to keep the word, people say, oh, we need more love, we need more love. Well, you know, that's not a bad thought. But if you don't keep the word, you're not going to get that more love. You might have emotions and feelings, but our faith in God is not based on feelings. Remember, we walk by faith, not by sight, which is a physical sense. We don't walk by feelings, which are physical senses. We don't walk by emotions, which are, if I could say it this way, soulish senses. We walk by faith in God's word. 
So if we begin being a doer of the word, then what happens is the love of God is able to be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and we begin to grow in the knowledge, the personal knowledge of God, and God's love begins to fill us. All right. So hereby, or by this, we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Even as who walked? Well, I start off in verse 2 talking about Jesus. So we ought to be walking like Jesus. That means we ought to be ministering to people. We ought not to be looking out so much for ourselves, but be looking out for how we can bless others. Amen. Too many Christians looking out for themselves. What can God do for me? Well, there's a place for that, and there's a place where you're trusting God for you know, your needs and your provisions and even the desires of your heart. But ultimately, we've got to get beyond ourselves. Job, in the Old Testament, had to get beyond his losses and complaining about his losses and start using his faith. And, and God led him into a place by telling him, you need to pray for your friends because the friends had turned against him. He said, pray for them. They're speaking harsh words against me. And Job began to pray for his so-called friends. It's kind of like, with friends like that, who needs enemies, right? He began to pray for his friends. It wasn't until he began to pray that actual faith began to be released once again into his life. And it wasn't until faith was released that God was able to restore to him twice what he lost. Hallelujah. We've got to quit looking at our problems and start looking at the solution which is God. Amen? So, he that saith he abided in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So, we know that we are in him because we're doing the word, not because we're being legalistic and, and doing it out of a ritual, religious ritual, but because we have a heart to do it. We've meditated upon the word, we've read in the word, we've prayed, we've fellowshiped with God we see the word tells us something, and we begin to act on that in faith. It almost becomes an instinctive thing that you're going to do the word without any uh, pause or without any, oh man, you know, God, if I don't do this, God's not going to be happy with me. That's religion. That's not faith. You do it because you love the Lord. I love him because he first loved me. The old song used to say that, amen? We used to sing that all the time. All right, so go to James now, chapter 1. Verse 22. King James translation. But, James is speaking here. He says, but be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, let's read it from the Amplified translation. But be doers of the word. Obey the message, not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. Reasoning without the word will bring about deception because reason will be based upon circumstances, upon emotion, upon mental uh, knowledge, but it reason will never on its own bring you to faith. Faith is not reasonable. It doesn't make sense to the natural mind to believe in something you cannot see, taste, touch, smell, sm smell, smell, <laughs> or hear. <laughs> Faith is not an object which can be touched or seen. We can, it's like electricity or wind. We can't see wind. We can feel the effect of wind. We can see the results of wind. But you can't, you can't just go out and and, oh, here's wind right there. I can feel it, you know. No, you'll feel it when it blows. Electricity, you can't feel it unless you stick your finger on a hot wire, you know. But you can't see it, all right? So faith is a force. It's a power. It's the same force, the same power that God used to create the whole universe. He's made it available to us. So James goes on in verse 23, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a new man, beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and then goeth his way, and straight, straightway 
forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, which is the word of God, and continueth therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. How do you get that faith, that trust in God down into your heart? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, after you see it in the Word, you've got to make a decision. I'm going to act on the Word of God. And you're going to have to begin to talk in agreement with God's Word and not in agreement with the circumstance. I am healed. Instead of, oh, I've got this, I've got that, I've got the, you know. There's a, if any of you ever watched uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, uh, there's one of the episodes where uh, the two sons are invited to membership in um, this men's club. I, I don't want, know what they called it, but and they went down to the spa and they sat in the steam, in the steam room, and one guy talks about, oh man, I'm really tight in my neck, and I've got this, and I've got, and this guy's sitting back behind and says, oh yeah, I've got that. And another guy says, oh man, I've got a problem with my knee, you know, and this guy says, yeah, I've got that. And another guy says, yeah, my hip's been bothering me, and, he, and that old guy says, I've got that. And uh, Ray had sat in there for however long he was sitting in there. By the time he got home, he said, oh man, I got a stiffness in my neck, and my shoulders kind of hurt me, and my back, yeah, I need to, I need, I think I need to go back again tomorrow. He was picking up on that negativity by the words that others were speaking. Now, I know it's just a sitcom TV show, but what an illustration how you can be so easily swayed by other people's words rather than the Word of God. We need to make sure that we don't let other people put unbelief in us by the negative things they're saying. Amen? All right. So we look into the Word of God. The Word of God does not reflect back to us our condition. It reflects back to us what God has done. We look into the Word. We're supposed to be seeing ourselves as God sees us, not as the way we see us. So the mirror, or the, the Word of God, is a perfect mirror to look into to find out how you're supposed to look. How are you supposed to think about yourself? I am righteous. Well, who do you think you are? A child of God. <laughs> a joint heir with Christ. Uh, well, why, are you so good? You know. Well, I'm cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and I'm, Jesus has made me righteous. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm being perfected. Spiritually, I am perfected already. It's just the soul and the body that have to get in the line. But God receives me as I am. And as I grow in God, the other parts of me change and become conformed to the Word of God. I meditate the Word. I do the Word. I look into the mirror of God's Word, and I act upon what I see, and I bring myself into conformity to what I see in the Word. Hallelujah. It's always a better version of yourself. All right. So again, James doesn't really mention faith specifically there. But he's clearly teaching about principles of faith, isn't he? All right. He talks about meditating the Word of God, which is the part, verse 25, where it says, looking into the Word. He mentions doing the Word specifically in verse 22. Now, verse 26 says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridle not, bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. So we go from meditating the Word of God to doing the Word of God, to speaking or controlling our speech by the Word of God. That's why verse 26 comes after those verses, because if you don't get your words under control, you're not going to really begin to develop your faith and start getting results. You've got to begin to declare what God has said. We talked about speaking the end from the beginning. All right. So the principles of faith are clearly seen right there. Meditate the Word, look, looking into it. Do the Word. And then make sure that you control your words, that you speak according to the Word, and not according to the flesh, not according to the world around you, not according to the senses, not according to even reason. 
Some people say, well, that's not reasonable. No, I already said, faith is not reasonable. It's called faith for a reason. <laughs> because it's spiritual reason. Amen. All right. So, both of these, John and James, both talk about meditating, doing, and speaking in line with the Word of God. Paul talks about it oh, a whole lot. All right. Now, I've got oh, just maybe five or six minutes, it looks like, here. I want to go to Mark chapter 4. The third part of what I'm teaching tonight is the tools that Satan uses to make the word that you hear unproductive. See, John just told us, and, and um, James told us, about what makes the word productive and what makes the word unproductive. So here we see in Mark chapter 4, from, I'm going to read the Amplified Translation, verse 14. And we've all heard this. We've probably heard messages on this. It says, the sower sows the word. What does the sower do? He sows the word. What is sowing? It's planting. The sower plants the word. And we're going to find out more about that activity. But verse 15 says, The ones along the path are the ones who have heard the word. They have the word sown in their hearts. But when they hear, Satan comes at once. And by pressure, now I know the Amplified says by force. But probably a more clear, correct statement is by pressure. When you are tempted, tested, tried, or tribulated, according to James, it's all in the flesh. It's not God, it is the devil. It's all the same Greek word for temptation, test, trials, and tribulation. So when the devil puts pressure on you, that is the, the, the pressure of the sense realm to move you from God, from his promises, from healing, from blessing and prosperity and provision, to the opposite, which is the word of the devil, which is sickness and disease, poverty, lack and want, fear and anxiety, oppression, depression, so on. All right? So he says here, Satan come when the word is sown. Now it says they heard the word. And it says, but when that word is sown, Satan comes at once and applies pressure against you, particularly in the area of the word you've heard. If you heard the word on healing, it, it sometimes is not more than 24 hours before all of a sudden you got symptoms of sickness in your body. And you need to know the tactics. The Bible says we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. And you need, need to know this is how he does. All right? But it's pressure. So it says Satan comes at once and by pressure takes away the message or the seed. See, the word is the seed. So the devil puts pressure on you to try and take from you that seed that was sown in you tonight, last Sunday morning in church when you heard the word. All right, verse 16 says, And in the same way, the ones sown upon stony ground are those who, when they hear the word, again, these are people that hear the word, at once receive and accept and welcome it with joy. Now, over the years, I've been in church all my life. I've been in the ministry 47 years. Uh, my grandmother was a preacher. My mother was a worship leader in every church we were ever involved with. And um, so I, I've been around the, the things of God for a long time. What he says here, I have seen, not just back way back then, I've seen it in our own church. People come along, they hear the word, they get excited, they get turned on. They're going to believe God, they're going to go out and conquer the world. And sometimes that lasts a week. In some cases it only lasts a day. But then there's others who try and stick it out, and they last maybe six months, maybe a year. There's some that will stick out for a few years. But they're not getting results. And, and all, all along, the devil's whispering in the ear, this stuff doesn't work. You, didn't, you just quit. It's, you're wasting your time. Those are lies of the devil. you got to quit listening to them. And they begin to get discouraged because they listen to that instead of listening to the Word. And I'll give you an example. When you look at, hey, Terry, good to see you uh, tuning in tonight. Glad to have you with us. Um, the example I started talking about is when um, people, you know, they start getting into the Word, 
and uh, the pressure comes on them, and they begin to reason, like we talked about there uh, in James, they, they, or in, uh, uh, I guess it was John, First John. They begin to reason. James talks about reasoning uh, also. And what happens is they allow the natural man to supersede the spiritual man. They hear the voice of the natural, the senses, instead of the voice of the spirit. And they won't take time to meditate on the word, to renew their mind to the word of God. What I started to say a minute ago, we saw before I got sidetracked by seeing Terry's name there, uh, is when um, people, uh, when I when I do re a search on on uh, Facebook or Twitter or Periscope, and I can look and see and see the average number of minutes people are actually viewing things. All right, and uh, when I see. And I'm not talking about just our programming. I'm talking about this is general across the board. The average viewer only spends six minutes listening to the programming they're hearing. Six minutes. I'm, I'm teaching for an hour, and they want to only commit six minute, minutes. That means the Word of God is not priority in their lives. I appreciate people like Torsha and Karina and uh, Mary, Mary uh, that uh, cousin of mine that tunes in, um, and they sit they man they're tuned in for the whole thing glued to this uh, program to hear the word because they're serious about growing in the things of God and they're getting results they're getting testimonies the the people that tune in and Sunday mornings you know I look and I watch the count on my monitor and uh, you know I go back and I look and I see how many stayed and uh, you know there's a handful that stay and then there's uh, a whole bunch they're only there for six minutes or thereabouts and they're on to something else. They're just surfing the internet. They're, they're not really interested and hungry for the word of God or the things of God. They just want to get a little taste of what you got to say and then move on. But people do that with the word of God, the Bible itself. They'll read a scripture a day. Well, whoopee, you really did something great. You need to spend time meditating God's word. God said meditate day and night. That means it's something that goes with you all the time. We've got to become more serious about meditating and doing the Word, not just six minutes here and there. Amen? Amen. All right. So, the tools that Satan uses, again, Mark 14, I'm going to have to wrap this up right now. So we're going to stop there at, uh, well, we'll probably go back to the start of verse 14 next week and continue on. I know this isn't John but it correlates with what we've been reading. So we're tying all these pieces together. All right, praise God. We've got a couple minutes left. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of our partners that are praying, praying for us and, and giving and supporting this ministry. You're giving us the ability to do things that um, you know, helps us get, get it done, get the work done that God's called us to do. So thank you so much. We appreciate your confidence in this ministry. You're a blessing to us, and, and we trust we are being a blessing to you. Uh, if you're watching and not a partner, uh, and we're blessing you, we ask you to pray. Ask the Lord if He wants you to become a partner with us. And we're believing God for partners. We're believing for 100 partners that will faithfully support through prayer and through finances on a monthly basis. Daily prayer. We want you to pray for us every day. Because we're praying for you every day. And our partners get the bulk of our time, so know that. Uh, we will agree with you and pray for you and you can send us emails and we'll pray about you, whatever you need prayer for uh, but our partners it's like you taking uh, arm in arm with us and we're marching through the land conquering the work of the devil and bringing people to the knowledge of God and when you partner with us you get credit for everything we accomplish even though you may be just praying and giving finances which is not just because that's vitally important but you feel like, well, I'm not actually doing anything. Well, yes, you are. Your finances give us that ability to move forward. Your prayers help undergird us and strengthen us at those times when the devil wants to attack us. So we appreciate it. So if you want to partner with us, uh, you feel impressed of the Lord to begin to do that. We're not asking you to do any, any specific amount, just whatever God impresses upon your heart. <clears throat> There's different ways you can give. You can give by PayPal, which is a, a, a free... Uh, app you can put on your phone or pad um, 
and you, and you can give through PayPal. Our PayPal account uh, email is wemmons01 at gmail.com. That's also our email account. Uh, you can email us there if you got prayer requests or testimonies. We do want to hear from you, and we'll, get, we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as we can after we see it. Uh, another way you can give is we have a Venmo account, another free app. When you give on Venmo, uh, you can use checks or credit, not checks, but credit cards, or do it from your account. And uh, they don't charge any fees or take out anything when you give. It's very easy, so I'm encouraging people to get, a, uh, get a, the Venmo app on their phone or whatever you use and begin giving that way. Uh, look for William Emmons and you should see my face on there, and then you can give that way. If you want to give by check, you can mail it to Post Office Box 4238, West Hills, California, 91308, and we'll get that as soon as we do. Uh, we will pray and thank God for your support for this ministry. Anyway, we love you guys. We'll be back here next Tuesday night, same time, and Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Don't miss that. If you're not in this area... Um, and your church time is offset from our time of broadcast, you ought to tune in. Uh, if, you, if you can't, if it conflicts with your service, then uh, tune in later and watch it. Uh, you can go back to Facebook usually for the next few days and watch it uh, after 24 hours. We're usually up on my YouTube channel, which is William E. Emmons, no, it's Pastor William Emmons on YouTube, and you can go back and see uh, our messages and our services there. And with that, I'm over time, so I'm going to say good night and be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen.